Thank you so much for coming out tonight. My name is Ann Russett. I'm a planner with the city's community development department. And we are very pleased to host a nationally recognized authority on historic preservation and sustainability who brings his knowledge, experience, and insight to Cedar Rapids. Um, our guest speaker, Ed McMahon, holds the Charles E. Frazier Chair on Sustainable Development at the Urban Land Institute in Washington, D.C., where he is nationally known as an inspiring and thought provoking speaker and leading authority on economic development and land use policies and trends. His passion for protecting, celebrating, and leveraging unique historic resources has helped communities across the nation see their historic buildings as assets to building a better economy and a brighter future. Tonight, he helps us remember the true worth of preserver, preserving our community's character. Um, many of you know that the city of Cedar Rapids recently adopted its first historic preservation plan, and we are proud to be home to nine nationally recognized historic districts, nearly 40 nationally recognized historic, historic landmarks, two local historic districts, and one local historic landmark. Our community also proudly holds more than 1,000 individual historic properties throughout the city. As the Senior Fellow for Sustainable Development, Ed leads the Urban Land Institute's worldwide efforts to conduct research and educational activities related to environmentally sensitive development policies. Before joining the Urban Land Institute, Ed spent 14 years as the Vice President and Director of Land Use Planning for the Conservation Fund in Arlington, Virginia. He is also the co-founder and former president of Scenic America, which is a national nonprofit organization devoted to protecting America's scenic resources. He is the author and co-author of 15 books and over 300 articles, and over the past 30 years has worked with more than 600 communities in all 50 states on a wide variety of land use and economic development issues. So please join me in welcoming our guest speaker, Ed McMahon. Uh, th thank you, Ann, and good evening, everybody. It's great to be here. I'm always humbled by these uh, introductions. I, should, I need to change that. I'll never forget how uh, humbling an introduction would be until my wife showed up at one of my talks some years ago. And of course, I was really interested in what she thought about what I had to say. And so I went up to her afterwards and I said, well, honey, what'd you think? And she said, oh, well, that was just fine, but I want to talk about the introduction. It was ridiculous. She, she said, the only thing they didn't say about you is they didn't say you were a model husband. Now, did they? And I go, oh, no, but that's a great idea. Maybe I'll add that. And she says, go home and look up the definition of model in the dictionary. If you look up the definition, it's a small replica of the real thing. <laughs> so anyway, we're going to talk about three things tonight. We're going to talk about economic development, historic preservation, and community revitalization. And I want to tell you a little story about how I got interested in all these things. It goes back a pretty long way. It goes back to uh, literally the early 1970s. I was a young second lieutenant in the United States Army. I had just finished jungle warfare training and field artillery school, and I had a orders to a small fire base in the central highlands of Vietnam. And about literally a week before I'm supposed to go, I get a call from the Pentagon, and I have a colonel on the other end of the line, and he's with the personnel division, and he says to the lieutenant of command, do you have any interest in being reassigned to Germany? I'm like, okay. <laughs> so let, me, let me think about that. Uh, I said, yes, Germany sounds very exciting. I would love to go to Germany. And I got super lucky. I was sent to Heidelberg, West Germany, which was the headquarters for the US military in Europe and one of the most beautiful small cities on the planet Earth. I then spent the next two years of my life flying all over Europe in a helicopter as an aide to a United States general. And that experience completely and totally changed my life. But I didn't quite realize how much it was going to change my life until I flew home to Birmingham, Alabama, where I got, grew up. And I got out of the airplane and drove home. And for the first time ever, I saw the American landscape with a completely different set of eyes. Because, ladies and gentlemen, to travel is to learn. And that's what we're going to try to do tonight, is we're going to try to learn from some of the things that we see when we travel around this country and other places. And that's what we do at the Urban Land Institute where I work, which is to try to foster best practices in land use uh, and development. Let's see if we can get this to switch. It won't advance. Let's try this right here. Oh, it's a little switch. Okay. 
Right, there we go. All right, so you live in a very special place. And I'm sure you would agree that Iowa is a very special place and that Cedar Rapids is a wonderful city with great people, great resources, great history, great assets, and hopefully a great future. But you should also know that no place in America today stays special by accident. You know, uh, you know, and one of the reasons for that, of course, is because the world is changing faster than ever. There's really only two kinds of change in the world we live in today. There is planned change, and there is unplanned change. You can anticipate change, you can prepare for it, you can shape and direct it, or you can just let it happen. You know, depending on what kind of community you have, you can, you know, let somebody else determine your future, or you can determine your own future. And we're going to talk about tonight about how you might do that. Abraham Lincoln used to say that the best way to predict the future is to create it yourself. And so one of the things we try to do when we work with communities is to get people to, like you, the, the, the big leading experts in a community are the people who live there, which are also one of the greatest assets in a community. And growth is really about choices. We have all kinds of choices in how we grow. Should we be developing in our downtowns or spending more money out on the highway? And by the way, I really don't think that happy face makes that better. Uh, <laughs> but we have choices. Uh-oh. What did I do that time? Okay, and you know, it's also, it's about, when you think about growth, it's about our children. It's about our grandchildren. It's about the future, and it's about preparing for the future. It's also about balance. Uh, it's about the balance between conservation and economic development, jobs and the environment, new development and old development, the built environment and the natural environment. It's also about finding win-win solutions to the problems that face us today. I'm one of those people who think we spend way too much time in America fighting about what we disagree about, and not nearly enough time sitting down together to talk about what we do agree about. And I think what you find is when you actually do that, people actually agree a lot about the place that they live. And so some people always say to me, well, what is sustainable development? Well, it's certainly about a lot of the new technologies, you know, renewable energy and electric cars and green roofs. But it's really about a lot more than that. If you actually look up the definition of the word sustainable in the dictionary, it will tell you it means enduring. Enduring. A sustainable community, ladies and gentlemen, is a place of enduring value. So what's changing? These are some of the things that you basically have no control over. The national and global economy, demographics, technology, consumer attitudes and market trends, healthcare is changing, energy sources and transportation options, the weather is changing. <coughs> Let me give you one example of how communities are dealing with that. So I live in the Washington metropolitan area, a small town in Maryland, and for about 40 years, our utility company, which is called PEPCO, the Potomac Electric Power Company, has been telling small towns around Washington that they couldn't afford to underground utility wires. But guess what? About a year and a half ago, PEPCO announced they're setting aside $1 billion to start systematically undergrounding utility wires. Why? Because the extreme weather events are becoming more often. The power has been staying out longer. The economic losses have been growing. They basically concluded they couldn't afford not to underground the utility wires. So that's just one of the ways that change is happening. So let's talk about the economy. Yes, manufacturing is down almost everywhere in America, but business and professional services are up, and education and medicine is up even more. Did you know that today in 62 of the 100 largest cities in America, the biggest employer is a university or a hospital? In Birmingham, when I grew up, the biggest employer was U.S. Steel. It's gone. The biggest employer in Birmingham, Alabama today is the University of Alabama Medical Center. 17 hospitals in one place employing 75,000 people. And you know, some of you may have heard of Richard Florida. He wrote a book called The Creative Class. He has a new book out called The Great Reset. And he says, you know, how we live, work, shop, and move around is going to change. And the communities that you know, adjust to the future are going to prosper. Those that do not will decline. And sadly, we are becoming a nation of winners and losers. Communities that are preparing for the changes that are happening and are, you know, shaping them in a way that they like are going to be more successful than those that simply ignore those changes. 
And we're in a global competition now to attract and retain talent. When I got out of college, you know, we'd have these recruiters would come and, you know, young people would interview with a recruiter and then they would just move to wherever they got a job. Today, young people figure out where they want to live. And then they move to that city and they look for a job. It's a completely different kind of economy today. Let's talk about the economic development model. When I was growing up, it was all about cheap land and cheap gas and low-cost labor. It was about shotgun recruitment and buffalo hunting. Quality of life really didn't matter. And our most important infrastructure investment, like our rural economic development plan in Alabama, was let's just widen all the highways. And then, of course, we lined all the highways with a bunch of junk. Well, that simply doesn't work in the world we live in anymore, ladies and gentlemen. Today, it's not about low cost. It's about high value. It's not about cheap labor. It's about highly trained talent. It's not about what you don't have. It's about what you do have. That's what people call asset-based economic development. And quality of life is critically important in the world we live in today. And I can tell you that the most important infrastructure investment in America today is no longer roads, ladies and gentlemen. It is education. Education. So economic development is about choices. Should you spend all your time chasing, you know, new industry? You know, did you know that every year in America we only build about 400 plants, factories, or distribution centers to do anything anymore? So we have 25,000 incorporated communities that are all in competition to get one of those plant factories or distribution centers and they're, you know, we oftentimes have to give away the store to get them. So maybe we should be thinking about the industries that we already have and how we grow those industries. You know, so, you know, you're in a competition with every other community in this state and in the Midwest and in many other places. And economic development today is rarely about the one big thing. So for many years in America, we had an arms race, for example, to build the biggest convention center. And then it was festival marketplaces, which worked fine in places like Baltimore and Boston. But did you know that there were 21 other cities that built festival marketplaces that went bankrupt? Like in downtown Toledo, or in Richmond, or in Norfolk, or in Jacksonville. They always thought it was the copycat line. Well, it worked in Baltimore, it must work here too. And then it was aquariums. So even a place like Camden, New Jersey, said if they just built an aquarium featuring the fish of New Jersey, <laughs> that they could save Camden, New Jersey. Well, they did build that aquarium. It's a very nice aquarium. Did it save Camden? No, it did not. But successful economic development, ladies and gentlemen, is rarely about the one big thing. It's much more frequently about lots of smaller things working synergistically together off of a plan that makes sense for you and your community. Let's talk about demographics. You know, demographics are destiny. You know, we're getting older in America, we're getting younger in America, we're getting more diverse in America, like it or not. Every single day in America, 10,000 people turn 65. And that's gonna happen every day for the next 18 years. The baby boomer generation, my generation. But the biggest generation is the millennial generation. And did you know that the fastest growing form of household in America is a single person living alone? And yet for years we built housing like every single family in America was the Waltons, the mom, the dad, the two kids, and the, kids and the dog. Today, 75% of all American households have no school-aged <coughs> children. That's right, no school-aged children, which is one of the reasons why so many of our cities have come back to life. Because not only young people are moving into cities, but their parents are moving into cities as well because they're downsizing when they get older. They don't want a big yard to take care of anymore. They like to live near where their kids live and so on and so forth. And what about young people, the biggest generation in American history? Well, they're postponing home ownership. They're driving fewer cars and, you know, favoring walkable neighborhoods. They're concentrating in major metropolitan areas in certain small <laughs> towns and cities. You know, and they like these walkable neighborhoods where they can live in a car-like kind of a lifestyle. That doesn't mean giving up all your cars, but why do you think we have a sharing economy in America today? Car sharing, bicycle sharing, Airbnb, you name it. It's all about the new generation and what they want. Technology is changing the world we live in. The death of distance. 
You can do business anywhere in the world today. So if you can't differentiate Cedar Rapids, Iowa, from any other place, ladies and gentlemen, you're going to have no competitive advantage. So let me just give you one example. Some of you may have heard of Foster Freeze. He was <coughs> Rick Santorum's leading campaign contributor in the last presidential election. He's a major contributor to Republican candidates. He runs a mutual fund company called the Brandywine Investment Group. And for 40 years, this company, which was founded by his father, was headquartered in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. That's a busy suburb of Philadelphia. But Foster Freeze likes to fly fish. So every summer, he would fly out to Jackson Hole, Wyoming to go fly fishing. And guess what happened? One day, he's stuck in traffic along the Schuylkill Expressway, and all of a sudden, a light bulb goes on and says, hey, I can run a mutual fund company anywhere in the world. <coughs> picks up this entire company and moves it into downtown Jackson, Wyoming. Why is he there? Access to outdoor recreation. Who would have thought that that was an economic development driver? In fact, it's interesting. Montana State University did a study of every single business relocation that happened in the three Montana counties that have bucked Yellowstone National Park over a five-year period and asked people why do you open a business here. And it had nothing to do with low taxes and regulatory relief. Number one reason on the list was the beauty of the region. Number two is a good place to raise a family. Number three was access to outdoor recreation. You know, it's pretty interesting because if you had asked the commissioners of Bozeman County, Montana, like 20 years ago, to do anything to preserve the beauty of the region, they would have told you that was bad for business. Like, for example, to pass a sign ordinance. But it turns out it's just exactly the opposite. It's incredibly good for business. Consumer attitudes are changing. This is a front page story from USA Today about the fact that the average amount of time that Americans spend in an enclosed shopping mall or a strip mall has been going down for years. People go to buy what they want and they leave. You know, young people don't go to the mall anymore to hang out. They're going to coffee shops and restaurants and all kinds of other places. They, you know, we haven't built a single new and closed mall in the United States since 2006. We've closed 15% of all the existing malls. Another 30% are being turned inside out with housing put on top of them. You know, when I moved to Washington many years ago, we had 10 malls. 10 malls. <coughs> Three of them are left today. Three of the 10. We did open one more a few years ago in Loudoun County, Virginia. But now we have four enclosed malls where we had 10 25 years ago. So let's talk about market trends. The old one-size-fits-all solution to all kinds of development simply doesn't work in a world where we have so many different kinds of people who want so many different kinds of things. So in virtually every market in America, we have an oversupply of large lot suburban-style housing because that's basically all we've built for 40 years. And we have an undersupply of everything else. Small lot housing, in-town housing, apartments, you know, senior housing, cottages, bungalows, you name So let's talk about four critical elements in economic development. One is obviously talent, smart people. How do you attract and retain smart people? You know, so many communities in so many states, all the young people have been leaving. So figuring out how to attract and retain young people is pretty important. Innovation, the ability to generate new ideas and turn those ideas into a commercial reality. Anchor institutions are kind of important, universities and hospitals. So let me give you an example of that. So the two biggest recipients of federal research dollars in the United States are John Hopkins University of Baltimore, number one, and Stanford University, number two. So what's interesting about that is Stanford has basically figured out how to commercialize all of the research coming out of Stanford. They have turned into what we know as the Silicon Valley. But Hopkins, on the other hand, all their research was focused inwardly. They weren't really interested in what was going on in the city of Baltimore, despite the fact they're the biggest employer in the state of Maryland. And one of the reasons Baltimore is still a very economically challenged city is because their biggest institution, their anchor institution, was really unconcerned about how we could create jobs in that city. Connectivity, places where people and ideas can 
can easily connect. And it's not about rivers and railroads anymore today. It's about places. It's like about towns. It's about downtowns. And I'll talk some more about that. And finally, it's about distinctiveness. Probably, truly the only defensible source of competitive advantage for any place is your unique characteristics. Successful communities, ladies and gentlemen, are distinctive communities. I'm sure you've heard that slogan, keep Austin in view. Well, it's not just a funny slogan, it's actually an economic development imperative. It means keep Austin special, keep them unique, keep them on the cutting edge. You know, and even the World Bank has a new publication now called The Economics of Uniqueness, and they basically say what I just said to you, which is if you can't differentiate your community from any other community, you're simply going to have no competitive advantage. Sameness is not a plus in the world we live in today. Sameness is a minus. You know, so where is this? Anybody want to tell me where it is? Anywhere. Yeah, exactly. Is this Albany, out-of-town Providence, Pittsburgh, Tulsa, Topeka, who can tell? You know, Wallace Stegner, the great American author, he once wrote, he said, quote, if you don't know where you are, you don't know who you are. And by that, I think he meant that all of us, every American has a fundamental need for a sense of orientation, for a sense of roots, for a sense of place. Sense of place. Well, what is that? Well, it's a couple things. First, it's what makes your hometown different from my hometown. But more importantly, ladies and gentlemen, I believe sense of place is explicitly that which makes our physical surroundings worth caring about. That which makes our physical surroundings worth caring about. I can tell you that in many parts of the world today we're creating places that simply aren't worth caring about. And for all the improvements in cleaner air, cleaner water, better roads, better schools, faster computers, people still say, is this all there is? Can't our communities be more distinctive, more livable, more beautiful? Can't we have more connection with nature and the outdoors? So I guess a lot of questions, one of the questions that many human beings ask is how do you prevent your town from becoming any town USA? Well, part of it, you know, is to recognize that community character matters. As Mark Twain used to say, we take stock of a city like we take stock of a man. The clothes or appearance are the externals by which we judge. And let's take the community's front door, its gateway. And just like with meeting a person, a good first impression is important. And a bad first impression is hard to change. Do you think you'd rather visit the town of Franklin, Tennessee? or the town of Midfield, Alabama. Which one looks more like a community with a sense of pride and a sense of place? Which one looks more like a community that you would rather invest time or money in? Ladies and gentlemen, you know, I want you to think about this. You know, if you don't remember anything else I can say tonight, remember this. The image of a community is fundamentally important to its economic well-being. And what I mean by that is that every single day in America, people make decisions about where to live, where to invest, where to vacation, where to retire, based on what our communities look like. What they look like. So let me give you a couple of examples. Let's take tourism, for example. That's kind of important because it is the largest industry in the world. It is the first, second, or third largest industry in every single American state. So this is the official travel guide of Oregon, and their slogan is, Oregon, things look different here. Can you imagine a state travel brochure that says something like, Iowa, things look the same here. <laughs> well, of course not, because what is tourism? Tourism is about visiting places that are different, unusual, and unique. The more any community in Iowa comes to look just like every place else, the less reason there is to go there. On the other hand, the more a community does to enhance its unique assets, whether that's architectural, historical, cultural, you name it, the more people want to go there, because that's exactly what tourism is. If every place was just exactly like every place else, there'd simply be no reason to travel any place. The image of a community is fundamentally important to its economic well-being. You know, the home builders put it this way, they say that the place is becoming more important than the product. One of the things they will tell you today is that the 
character of the neighborhood is more important than the size of the lot. What is going on outside of the house is more important than what's going on inside of the house. You know, way back in 1994, the homeowners did a study. They were trying to figure out what was it that added value to a house more than anything else. Was it like the kitchen, the garage, the appliances? You know, what was it? Here's what they found. They found, quote, the surrounding environment is the single most important factor affecting the market value of a home. A mountain vista or a proximity to a park or water or a green space affects the value of a home more than the size of the house, the number of rooms, the type of appliances, or even the presence of a swimming pool. The surrounding environment. It's why realtors like to talk about location, location, location. Did you know that there are literally hundreds of studies that show that green space increases the value of adjacent property? And if you didn't believe that, well, just think about, you know, here's an example. You know, where's the most valuable land in all of New York State? Well, of course, it's the land next to Central Park. But let me give you a, a closer to home example. Let's talk about golf course developments for a minute. We have 15,500 golf course developments in America. Down, that's down about 500 from five years ago. But why did developers build golf courses in developments in the first place? I'll tell you why. Because they figured out that they could charge a lot premium for a house that was next to a golf course anywhere from 10 to 30% more than the exact same house not next to a golf course. But guess what? Did you know that the vast majority of people who live in golf course developments in America do not play golf? So if you interview them and ask them why you live there, here's what they'll tell you. Oh, I like the view across the fairway. I like to live next to the protected open space. Well, duh. What does it cost to build a golf course? Millions of dollars. What does it cost to maintain a golf course? Millions of dollars. What does it cost to leave the open space alone in the first place? It's like almost nothing. So a growing number of developers in America started to figure out that they could build a golf course development without the golf course. It's what the, some of us call conservation communities. And no, you can't play golf there. But you can walk your dog, you can throw a frisbee, you can have a picnic, you can lie in the grass, you can do anything you want. And by the way, what's the most popular form of outdoor recreation in America? Walking for pleasure. Number one, golf isn't even close. Did you know that the Wall Street Journal tells us that 4 million people have quit playing golf in the last 10 years? Mostly young people. Why? Because it's too time consuming, too difficult, too expensive. So we had all these developers who were building an amenity, the most expensive amenity wanted by the smallest number of people. So let's talk about the value of historic buildings, neighborhoods, and landscapes. Why are they important? Sometimes we kind of forget why old buildings matter. And you got some great older buildings in this community, although they're clearly torn down an enormous number of them. But let's sort of go back to first principles. Some of you may have read some of Thomas Wolfe's famous novels like Look Homeward Angel. Tom Wolfe, he's the guy that penned the immortal line, you cannot go home again. Well, sadly, he can't go home again because here's his house in this parking lot in Asheville, North Carolina. Why are historic buildings important? Well, first and foremost, because these are the places that physically connect us to the past. These are the places that tell us who we are and where we came from. You know, a city without a past is like a man without a memory. As, you know, Daniel Webster runs wrote, he said, quote, the man who feels no sentiment or veneration for the memory of his forefathers is himself unworthy of kindred regard and remembrance. At its essence, saving the historic buildings of Iowa and Cedar Rapids is about saving the heart and soul of Iowa and Cedar Rapids. But it's also incredibly important to your economic well-being as well. Let me give you a couple of examples. This is a, you know, a fire station in a small town in southern Wisconsin. And this building became, you know, obviously became obviously a fire station. And the guy bought it and turned it into a pizza parlor. And like so many other small towns in America, this was Sheboygan Falls, Wisconsin. This was a town headed downhill. And they brought in something called the Main Street Program, one of the most powerful tools 
for downtown revitalization we've ever invented. And they started working with the owners of downtown buildings to restore their facades, and they did that. And guess what else guess happened? You know, it tells a story about the history of the building, but you know what else happened? Sales of pizza almost doubled. And they sustained that over a multi-year period. Let me give you a couple of nationally famous examples. <coughs> Welcome to New Orleans, a city I know very well, but I spent many months down there after Hurricane Katrina. I was on the redevelopment team for the city. And of course, they asked us to put together a plan, not just a physical redevelopment plan, but an economic redevelopment plan. So we said to them, well, what are your biggest industries? Is it, is it the oil industry, the seafood industry, the chemical industry, the sugar? They said, no, no, the biggest single industry in all of Louisiana is the tourism industry. And what is the engine of that industry? Well, it's the French Quarter and all the other historic neighborhoods in New Orleans. But did you know that for about 40 years, the Louisiana Department of Transportation wanted to put a freeway through the French Quarter? Ladies and gentlemen, that is more important and more valuable than any plant factor distribution center in the entire state of Louisiana. But we just didn't really understand that as economic development. Let me give you another example. Let's go to San Antonio, Texas. Let's visit the San Antonio Riverwalk. That is the number one destination in all of Texas. It is the basis of that city's multi-billion dollar year annual tourism industry. And it is the single defining characteristic of San Antonio. But once again, one thing most people don't know is that at one point in the past, the city council of San Antonio thought so little of that small river, they actually wanted to put it underground into a culvert. Today, it is the single most visited place in all of Texas. Let's fly out to Seattle and go to the Pike Place Farmer's Market, the number one destination in the state of Washington. It's millions of visitors every year. If you go to Seattle, you remember three things, the Pike Place Market, the Space Needle, and that the sun is shining, Mount Rainier. But once again, about 30 years ago, a couple of people on the city council seriously wanted to tear down the Pike Place Market. Why? They said, oh, we need more downtown parking. <laughs> Why parking for what? <laughs> you can have all the parking in the world. If there's nothing to do, no one's going to ever want to go there. Parking is very important, but it is not as important as actually having buildings in a downtown that somebody might want to do something in. You know, we work, we do workshops all over the country with communities that are always concerned. They think the parking problem is the biggest problem. It's almost always the second biggest problem. The biggest problem is creating a place that people would want to park to go to. How about Florida? What's the biggest destination for it? It's called Disney World. What's number two? You're looking at it called the Art Deco Historic District in South Miami Beach. It's the largest collection of Art Deco buildings in the United States. They were all going to be torn down. There were people saying, well, we've got to have more high-rise condos in South Florida. How many, anybody ever been to South Florida recently? Today, this is one of the greatest urban places in all of North America. People come from all over the world to visit this place. How about the camp? Uh oh, I'm sorry about that. How about the Camden Yards baseball stadium in Baltimore? It is the most successful, the most widely emulated sports stadium ever built in the United States. And not just because it was a new stadium, because we got lots of new stadiums, but because it was the first of the so-called retro stadiums. It did the best job of integrating new construction with the historic buildings that surrounded that site. Now notice a couple of things here. You'll notice that the field is 12 feet below the street level. Why did they do that? Well, because they didn't want the stadium to tower over the road houses that surround the stadium. They were thinking about how to be a good neighbor, how to make new construction fit with old construction. Well, there's a concept. So, you know, think about it. You know, Arthur Frommer, who's America's leading travel writer, put it this way. He said, among cities and towns with no particular recreational appeal, those that preserve their past continue to enjoy tourism. Those that haven't receive almost no tourism at all. Tourists simply won't go to a city or town that has lost its soul. So saving the soul of the community is kind of important, and it actually goes well beyond tourism. So this is a magazine, Southern Business and Development. It's essentially for uh, you know, office park and industrial park developers. But notice their headline, on site searching the south, make sure you inspect the community's downtown first. So why is downtown important? I'll tell you why. Because if you don't have a healthy downtown, you simply don't have a healthy town. 
The apple rots from the inside out. If we haven't learned anything else in the last 30 years, it's if, you know, it's hard to be a suburb of nothing. And, you know, if you were an economic development person, the first thing you would look at when you came to a city would be the downtown. It is the icon of any community, and it's also a key critical nerve center in this idea where people and ideas can connect, which is one of the reasons why in our new economy, businesses are moving back into downtown. Motorola, GE, Marriott, three companies that announced they're moving from suburban office parks into downtowns in just the past few months. There's a study I'll show you later of hundreds of new companies moving back into our downtowns. You know, Sears moved out of the Sears Tower out to an office park in suburban Chicago. Guess what? They're moving back downtown into the merchandise market. You know, because they found it's easier to attract and retain talented young people when they are in the middle of the town. And so let's talk about the Main Street program. The single most powerful tool for economic revitalization in the United States, but we kind of just like, you know, thought that was sort of a, you know, a, a frill. You know, fixing up those facades. Well, it turns out that that's pretty darn good for business. There is nothing that has created more jobs and business redevelopments than the Main Street program. This is a little town where my daughter lives, Frederick, Maryland. It's a small city. It has about 45,000 people. Uh, and in the early 1990s, they had a huge flood there. And it was the flood was along Carroll Creek, which you see in the bottom down there. And you know what they realized is that adversity can breed opportunity. And so they decided to redevelop Carroll Creek as basically a, a small town version of the San Antonio Riverwalk. And people thought, well, that was a big waste of money until it brought the downtown back to life. That $11 million public investment led in 10 years to $250 million in private investment. And today, this is the fastest growing city in all of Maryland. Today, in this small city, there are 5,000 people living in the downtown. There are hundreds of small businesses, including 200 retailers in the downtown. There were none in 1990. To give you some idea of what a town can do when it sets its mind to turning itself around. So older, smaller buildings. So I was in Buffalo last year, and I was in a, a little neighborhood called Elmwood Village. And Elmwood Village was this booming place. And you know, I went into downtown, and downtown, which has got much bigger buildings and it's seen much more public investment, seemed you know like relatively dead by comparison. And you know, it was kind of interesting because what we found out is that older, smaller buildings punch above their weight class, dollar for dollar and square foot for square foot. They're outperforming much larger buildings if they simply are given a chance to you know exist. So Jane Jacobs in her famous book. Life and Death of Great City, Great American Cities. Way back in 1961, she said that large-scale demolition is what we do as urban renewal, essentially drains the life out of communities. And obviously, a lot has changed in you know, the last 60 years, so does, those, does that apply today? Well, there's a brand new study out by the Preservation Green Lab. Basically, it looked at three cities. They looked at Washington, Seattle, and San Francisco and compared neighborhoods with small historic buildings to neighborhoods with large new buildings. For example, in Washington, they compared K Street, which is our sort of lobbyist quarter, all these big office buildings, to H Street Northeast. And what they found was that small buildings were doing things that the big buildings weren't doing. They had more jobs per square foot. They had more locally owned businesses. They had more non-chain stores. They had more women and minority owned businesses. They had higher night and weekend activity. How did they know that? Well, because of something called big data. So that now they can look at cell phone usage after nine o'clock at night and compare neighborhood to neighborhood. It turns out all the cell phones are being used at night in these smaller neighborhoods like Ainsley Park in Atlanta, or Oak Park in Chicago, or you know, the German Village in Columbus, I could go on and on, or Georgetown in Washington, D.C. You know, greater concentration of creative class jobs, more affordable, flexible space for entrepreneurs. You know, so we did a study in Los Angeles, turns out the single most popular office space is old warehouse buildings, <coughs> because it's flexible space, it's the kind of space that has character that these young tech companies like. <coughs> to be in. 
You know, so when people tell you that we just, oh, these, these small buildings don't really matter, it doesn't really, it flies in the face of what the research is telling us. And there are a lot of other benefits as well. Did you know that the greenest building is the one already built? It's simply because of the concept of embodied energy. You can build a very you know, high performance LEED certified building, and we should be doing that with our new buildings. But you know, if you have to tear down a building to do that, it'll take you 40 years to get back to where you started. You know, and by the way, the lifespan of a typical historic building is a couple of hundred years. The lifespan of a typical new building is you know, 20 to 35 years. We built a new football stadium for the Washington Redskins like 15 years ago. We're going to tear it down again. You know, it's kind of what we, you know, today we sort of you know, have these disposable buildings. <coughs> so some of your older buildings are some of, you know, they'll just, just stick around. And they're the kind of buildings that creative class people want to work in. And by the way, most job creation in America is not in big business, it's in small business. Frederick, Maryland, 25 small high tech companies in the downtown, in small historic buildings. But, you know, I would guess that most of you in this room are in favor of preserving the best of the past, or you probably wouldn't be here tonight. But I want to ask you this question. What are you building today in Iowa that will be worth preserving in the future? What buildings will your children, your grandchildren, fight to save 50 years from now? And I ask that question for a couple of reasons. First of all, because 80% of everything ever constructed in America has been built since about 1950. And a lot of it is just plain junk. It's also important because as Winston Churchill once said, he said, quote, we shape our buildings and then our buildings shape us. And by that, I think he meant that the physical character of our community affects who we are as a people, as a nation. It affects whether we can even have a sense of community. So here's what we've been doing for years, tearing down houses like the one in the background to put up a new Kentucky fried chicken with a plastic red Nansen art boot. You know, basically building throwaway America. You know, so we need to think about how new construction might enhance community care. So some great examples of that today when we drove around town. There's some wonderful new infill projects that really speak to the history of this community. You know, we live in a nation of highly varied history, climate, culture, and terrain. And some of our communities look like they're being built with Legos interchangeable parts. Ask yourself this question. Do you think that every chain store and every franchise in America has to look exactly alike? Whether it's in Maine or Maryland, Missouri, Montana, or Cedar Rapids, Idaho? Iowa, excuse me. <laughs> the answer to that, ladies and gentlemen, is no. Of course not. Mm -hmm. Any building can fit in with your community. That is a new McDonald's. It's in a small town in Long Island called New Hyde Park, New York. Prospective brides who are there to pose for their bridal photographs. Not something you'd say every day about a McDonald's in America, now is it? <laughs> but I want to tell you something. This is actually going on all over America. Let me show you a couple of other examples. I've got hundreds of what I'm going to show you a handful of here. <clears throat> Here's a new McDonald's in the state of Vermont. And it looks like a New England style building. Why is that? <laughs> because it's in New England. Don't you think that buildings in one part of America ought to be different from buildings in another part of America? Shouldn't a new McDonald's in New England be different from a new McDonald's in the desert southwest? And shouldn't a new McDonald's in the desert southwest be different from a new McDonald's in the southeast? And shouldn't a new McDonald's in the southeast be different from one in the midwest? And shouldn't a new McDonald's in a small town in North Carolina be different from one in a city in Virginia? And shouldn't they all be different from that one in the small town in Maryland? Or the big city in Missouri? Yeah, that's a McDonald's at the foot of the Gateway Arch. Built by a savvy developer who realized that when food was no longer the novelty, correct me if I'm wrong, are hamburgers still a novelty in America? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, once again, sameness is not a plus in America. Sameness is a minus. So you say to yourself, how did they do this? I'll tell you how they did this. They asked for this. If you accept off-the-shelf, corporate, cookie-cutter architecture, you're going to get it 100% of the time. 
He started insisting on something that fit your community. You could get that 100% of the time. Now, I'm not telling you that's easy. No, it is not easy, but it is going on all over the United States and all over the world. Here is the first McDonald's in America that went into an historic building. That's in the town of Freeport, Maine. That's where the L.L. Bean Corporation is headquartered, and that is a McDonald's. That's the Gore House. It was built in 1833, and in 1980, 36 years ago, McDonald optioned that corner. They wanted to tear down that house. They wanted to put up their typical suburban-style McDonald's, and the town of Freeport said no. And they sued the town of Freeport, and they lost. And then they sued the town of Freeport a second time, and they lost again. But guess what? Three years later, a picture of that McDonald's appeared in their annual corporate report as an example of their good community stewardship. <laughs> but I want to tell you something. They're not suing anybody for this anymore. They're doing this all over the world. But only in communities that are savvy enough to say, I want something that fits with my town. I don't want your off-the-shelf model. What you need to know about chain stores and franchises is that every single one has plan A. Plan B and Plan C. And what gets built depends on you. It's kind of like the good witch of the West said in the Wizard of Oz, you have the power. You've always had the power. You know, it's interesting to me, you know, if I were to go into some small town out west and tell them that the federal government was going to come in and tell them what their town was going to look like, it'd be like, get the guns, we're going to fight. <laughs> but you let these multinational corporations come into your communities and determine what your community look like. You don't have to. What's more important, having the character of Cedar Rapids shape the new development? Or having the new development shape the character of Cedar Rapids? How you answer that question will determine what kind of community you have 25 years from now. And I can tell you that this can apply to anything. You've all seen these Pizza Huts, Plan A, Red Roof. Just ask, they give you a brown roof. What do you want, Red Roof, Brown? Try a little harder and get Plan C. And by the way, all the plan C's are different because every place is different. So how about a CVS or a Walgreens or a Rite Aid? Okay, here's your off-the-shelf, you know, Walgreens. They want the maximum corner in every community in America. They want to go tear down that some building there. So, you know, you know, you could take that or you could maybe take this or maybe you could take that. Okay, and by the way, as I said before, all those plan C's are different because every one of these is different. That's Oak Park, Illinois. This is Bexley, Ohio. You know, I can just go on and on. Ladies and gentlemen, the whole paradigm is shifting, particularly in the retail world and housing. You know, so this was our model in commercial development for years. Strip malls coming soon. But I want to tell you that strip development is development for the last century. The future belongs to town centers and main streets and mixed-use development. And I want to give you some of the reasons why. First of all, we're completely overbuilt on the Strip. Did you know that we built retail space for about 40 years in America, five times faster than retail sales? Which is why every time we open a new Strip Center, we cannibalize another one right down the road. And, you know, we went from four square feet of retail space per person in 1960 to almost 40 square feet of retail space by 1980, excuse me, by the year 2000. If we didn't learn anything else in the recession, we learned we were overstored in America. And right now we have over a billion square feet of vacant retail space in America, including <coughs> hundreds of empty big box stores all over the countryside. And Walmart just announced they're going to close 250 more stores. So you've seen that in Iowa. Walmart will come in and put a you know, a new Walmart here and another Walmart in that store. Then they close three of the Walmarts and open a super Walmart. Then they have three dead downtowns and three empty Walmarts. Okay? So, you know, but here's what consumers are saying. You know, I talked about those 10 malls we had when I moved to Washington. There's three left. It's because, you know, the, yes, the best malls, like Tyson's Corner, they're doing fine, but all the other malls were starting to become non-competitive. Here's a great example. This is the county seat of the county I live in. This is Montgomery County, Maryland. Montgomery County is the biggest county in Maryland. It's got about one and a half million people. And this is the county seat, Rockville, Maryland. In 1970, in their infinite wisdom, they thought it was a great idea to tear down their entire downtown and replace it with this, the Rockville Mall. But guess what? They've now torn the mall down. They put the downtown back. 
kind of a metaphor for America, and that's kind of what's happening all over the country, and it's what happening here too. So some people say, you know, too many people say, oh, it's too late for us. We already got all this junk. Ladies and gentlemen, it is never too late. Community character deteriorates one building and one project at a time, and it can get better one building and one project at a time. You know, George H.W. Bush he used to be a tree guy. He liked planting trees. He used to say that the best time in America to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The second best time is tomorrow. That's the way you need to think about development and redevelopment. It's never too late to start. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, that is the new promised land. You know, you had that song by Joni Mitchell, tear up paradise and put in a parking lot. Well, now we can tear up the parking lots and put paradise back. And, you know, we have, you know, these great field sites all over America. You're full of them here at Cedar Rapids. You have millions of acres of, you know, underperforming, underutilized, you know, empty parking lots, etc. And that's one of our greatest development opportunities because we already have sewer and water in there. We've got a road out front. It's a way to save rural land. It's a way to turn a NIMBY into a YIMBY. Yes, I want that in my backyard. And so we're changing. So this is a typical Best Buy spread out, single use drive on. Let me show you a new one in St. Louis Park, Minnesota. There's one. Okay. It's, you know, there's, you know, it's compact, it's mixed use, you can walk or drive there. And I understand, you know, you might not want to live there. But it turns out there are a lot of people, like some of those 75% of American households who don't have school age children who actually like the idea of sleeping upstairs and shopping downstairs. You say, well, you know, we can never do that in Iowa. Well, maybe you can do something like this. This is a new Dairy Queen in the small town of Herndon, Virginia. It has a dentist office upstairs. How appropriate. <laughs> you know, who would you rather live next door to anyway? A house full of out of control teenagers or a dentist office? Which one would have more impact on your quiet enjoyment of your home? It's not about the use anymore, it's about the impact of the use. So, you know, retailers are throwing out all their old models. They would have never done this. Like, uh, here's a Paris Teeter grocery store with uh, apartments on top or small footprint, you know, Whole Foods. Or there's one of the Walmarts in multi-story buildings, urban Walmarts. Who would have thought? Or restoring a store building. That's the Carson Prairie Scott building downtown Chicago. Sat vacant for 15 years until Target went in and restored the building. They're moving back into all the old department stores. Because you know why? Because there's only one place left in America with more spending power than stores. It's in our cities and in our downtowns. And that's why people are, one of the reasons they're moving back. And I talked about that study earlier, where in the last five years, 500 major American companies have moved from suburban office locations back into downtowns. You know, Marriott, which is headquartered, you know, has been in an office park off the Washington Beltway for like 40 years. They're just moving back into town, right? Because they want to be on a metro stop. <laughs> you know, and here's the, you know, think about Walmart, okay? Here's the old paradigm. You want to show you the new paradigm? Here it is. Here's the first Walmart built in Washington, D.C. It's in a five-story building. It has 200 apartments above the Walmart. It actually has real windows that let in actual real sunlight onto the floor of the Walmart. <laughs> hey, there's a swimming pool on the roof of that building. There's a fitness center in the glass in area. Where's the parking? It's under the building. You know, it's what, like what we used to call a department store. <laughs> Duh, well, who would have thought? There's a new Target in Minneapolis. Or how about the new Target in the old department store in Portland? Or how about a new Home Depot in New York City? Somebody saw, saw this once and they said to me, well, how do you get your lumber home? Well, they deliver. <laughs> well, there's a concept, they deliver. How about that? Well, let me show you another example that just I saw last year. So I was in Fayetteville, Arkansas, and I, they have this airport down there called the Northwest Arkansas Airport. It's up by Bentonville, and you have to go driving down the interstate. Got off the agent to go into Fayetteville, and there's a Waffle House out by the interstate. You've all seen Waffle Houses out by interstates, right? And I didn't pay any attention to that until I got into downtown Fayetteville, and there was another Waffle House on the main street. Brand new building had three floors of housing on top of the Waffle House. And I thought that was kind of interesting because I had never seen a Waffle House with housing on top. So I decided to go track down the city hall and find, go in and find the planning department in the Fayetteville City Hall. And I go and said, Tell me about that Waffle House. Turns out they'd already done a study on the Waffle House. 
It turns out the downside of Waffle House is producing more taxes per acre, more jobs per acre, more residents per acre. 73 people live upstairs above the wall, above the, 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 uh, the pancake house in downtown Fayetteville. Well, nobody lives above the pancake house out on the highway. And this is why the future belongs to mixed use development, because it's outperforming segregated drive all along the development. And by the way, more people are walking to and from the pancake house, which you probably need to do anywhere, or the waffle house. After you eat a lot of waffles, you probably do need a walk. <laughs> you know, and so this is an example of why the world is changing. And we have a concept in the real estate arena, it's called the place making dividend. That simply means people stay longer, they spend more money, and they come back more often to places that attract their affection. How many people in Iowa do you really think feel really affectionate about strip malls? How many people want to go to the strip mall just to like hang out? But people will go to a you know a, a cool neighborhood and hang out because it's a place they like to be. They'll come back more often. And that's where the world is going if you would embrace that. So I want to end by just sharing you with you what I call my secrets of success with communities. I've been in this business for a long time. As Ann said, I've worked in about 600 communities. I've come to some conclusions about why we have a relative handful of really successful communities in America. We've got thousands of others that are just going down the tubes. So first and foremost, successful communities always have a vision for the future. Some people might call that a plan for the future. And I can tell you there's some people in America who are proud to tell you they're against planning. But I always say to them, then you tell me the name of any successful organization, institution, corporation, or community that doesn't plan for the future. Failing to plan simply means planning to fail. As the book of Proverbs says, without vision, the people will perish. You know, Imagine a corporation that didn't have a business plan. They would have a very hard time getting investors. It's the same thing with the community. Without a plan for the future, without a blueprint, you're simply not going to grow as well as a community that actually does plan for the future. And successful plans always grow out of an inventory of their assets. Successful communities build their tourism plans, their land use plans, their downtown revitalization plans around the enhancement of their existing assets. Successful communities use education, incentives, partnerships, and voluntary issues, not just regulation. Now, I didn't say against regulation. We need some regulations. They prevent bad things from happening. Sets a minimum standard of conduct. But you've got to use carrots, not just sticks. I'll show you some examples in a minute. Successful communities pick and choose among development proposals. All development is not created equal. Some development will make Cedar Rapids a better place to live in, to look at, to work in, to visit. Some won't. The biggest impediment to better development in small cities in America is a fear of saying no to anything. Well, if you're afraid to say no to anything, you'll simply get the worst of everything. And the communities that set no standards or low standards simply compete right to the bottom. <coughs> communities that set high standards compete to the top because they know if you say no to bad development, you're always going to get better development in its place. Successful communities cooperate with their neighbors for mutual benefit. Successful communities think about community character. Successful communities have strong leaders and good citizens. Let me show you a couple of examples. So this is the one city in America that people growing up in Birmingham used to make fun of, Chattanooga, Tennessee. It was called the most polluted city in America. It was known as a patch of rust in the Sun Belt. Well, nobody makes fun of Chattanooga anymore. It's now known as an international model for community revitalization. It all began with a vision for the future. It was the first small city in America that went through a large-scale community visioning process. And they basically asked people, what do you like about Chattanooga? What don't you like? What do you want to change? What do you want to save? And they decided to focus on two big things, downtown Chattanooga, because downtown is the heart and soul of any community, and the Tennessee River, because that was their most important natural asset. And when they started, all of downtown Chattanooga looked like that. It was one boarded up building after another. And they didn't take the, the biggest project first. They took the smallest project first. They realized that nothing succeeds like success. So they restored that one building. And then people said, that looks pretty good. How would you do that? And they restored another building and another building. And they started doing bigger projects. This is the outlet mall of Chattanooga. It's not on, on the highway somewhere. It's in downtown, an old restored warehouse buildings. 
And then they created the first land trust in the South, the Tennessee River Gorge Trust, to save the Tennessee River Gorge. That's 15 minutes from downtown Chattanooga. They saved their view, and they all got tax credit too. So now that's one of the great places to go see in the South. And then they decided to build a hiker biker trail all along the river, 10 miles, both sides of the river. And when they first proposed it, the cost was $15 million. That's a lot of money for a small city. But I want to tell you something. How much something costs is not the most important question. It is the second most important question. What is the most important question facing the rapids? It's what should we do? What should we do? It turns out money always follows good ideas, especially if those ideas come out of some consensus building process. And that's what happened in Chattanooga. They built that trail. And it's leveraged a billion dollars of new private investment directly adjacent to it. And because they had a vision for the future, they were able to do some pretty remarkable things. This is the Walnut Street Bridge in downtown Chattanooga. It's obviously a highway bridge. It was, you know, the Tennessee DOT had set aside millions of dollars for the demolition of that bridge. But Chattanooga said, no, we have a better idea. Give us the money you use to tear it down, and we'll turn it into the nation's longest pedestrian bridge that now has revitalized neighborhoods at both ends of the bridge. Let me give you a small town example. Welcome to Susan City, California. 1990, this was voted the worst place to live in Northern California. That was their city hall. It was in two double-wide trailers. <laughs> This is the only city hall in California had to register the Department of Motor Vehicles. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, public buildings are kind of important. And public buildings were always our most beautiful buildings up until World War II. They were always down there, whether it was the courthouse, the fire station, the public school, you name it. And then we decided cheaper was better. And you know what we've learned? We've learned that cheaper is simply cheaper. And you know what they said in Susan City, California? They said, why would anybody invest in a community that wouldn't invest in itself? So they built a new city hall right on the same spot. And guess what? One decade later, they were voted one of the best places to live in Northern California. But it all began with an investment in themselves. Let me give you another small town example. Welcome to Port Royal, South Carolina, the gateway to the Paris Island Marine Corps base. It was a funky little town going no place. That was their city hall. They kind of went through the same assessment. What are our assets? What should we do? They decided to build a new city hall. There it is. Okay? That created a sense of belief that the town could change. And so a local developer came in and he found a piece of land right on the edge of downtown. He decided to extend the street grid into this piece of land. He didn't put a bunch of cul-de-sacs in there. You know, dead-end streets. He, he just put the street grid in. And he went to a local architect and said, could you design some new houses for me that look like old South Carolina houses? They said, yeah, we could do that. They built 41 new houses, and they all sold in about four months. And these 41 houses changed this town forever, for the better. And basically, everything started to change. Because so now you have 41 new families living in town. And so it used to be that the downtown was like one empty board of building after another. But now you have all these new families living, and they start looking at these buildings with a fresh set of eyes. And one after another, they start restoring them. And then the school board says, well, the school, the elementary school is too small. We've got to tear it down. We've got to move out to the highway. And the new families say, no, don't do, don't do that, because then none of the kids will be able to walk to school. Why don't you just put an addition on the school? Oh, I never thought of that. So they put an addition on the school. Now all the kids walk to school in Port Royal, South Carolina. And then they said, the post office, we're too small. We've got to move out to the highway. And they said, no, you don't. We'll find you a new piece of land. And when we do, you're going to build us a beautiful neoclassical post office. And they did this. Successful communities inventory their assets, natural, cultural, human, economic, educational. And you know, sometimes those assets are pretty obvious. Welcome to Jackson Hole, Wyoming, world-class scenery, unparalleled wildlife resources. Or welcome to Annapolis, Maryland, unparalleled architectural and historical legacy. And they built both these communities, they built their plans around enhancement of this. In the case of Jackson, about their scenery. The wildlife, in the case of that I mean, in Annapolis, it's about the history and the architecture. Sometimes the assets community are not very obvious. Welcome to Lowell, Massachusetts. 1975, it was a dying industrial city. It had an unemployment rate of 27%. It had never seen a single tourist that didn't think it had any assets, but what it had was abandoned textile mills. It had good leadership and a vision for the future, and today they've restored all of those mills. 
Today, this is the Charleston, South Carolina of New England. This is a city that now gets almost a million tourists a year. The city that has come back to life by taking those empty textile mills and giving them new uses. Or how about the torpedo factory in Alexandria, Virginia? Who would think that that could be turned into the single best art center in America? 200 working artists in an art center that gets 2 million visitors a year. Or how about Paducah, Kentucky? They turned their flood walls into incredible outdoor murals. Or how about Rapid City, South Dakota? They kept, you know, they were always thinking they didn't have enough parking. Turns out they didn't have anything to do with downtown until they put this square in. And now the downtown has come back to life. Or how about Akron, Ohio, where they had the Quaker Oaks headquarters was? And they took that grain elevator and turned into Quaker Oaks Hilton, which began the revitalization of downtown Akron. Or how about Poughkeepsie, New York, which has the highest bridge over the Hudson River, 274 feet up. It was abandoned in 1973. It was just sitting there getting ready to fall down until a group of people decided to turn it into a state park called the Walk Across the Hudson State Park, which is now attracting half a million tourists a year to a town that nobody was going to before they did that. Successful community education, incentives, partnerships, and volunteer initiatives. Why do we educate? In order to reduce the need to regulate. Why do we educate? Because people won't embrace what they don't understand. Why do we educate? Because you have a right to choose your future but to also know what all the choices are. We need to use carrots, not just sticks. So let me give you a couple of examples. How about conservation easements? You know, that's just a voluntary tool to save open space and save your view and get a tax break to the set for How about store preservation tax credits? This used to be the abandoned Lone Star Brewery in San Antonio, Texas. Using the store preservation tax credit and incentive to turn into a world-class museum of art. How about Yazoo City, Mississippi? They had somebody from Yazoo City went to Ireland and heard about something called the Tiny Town Program. All they do is pass out free paint to downtown business owners. They painted their way back to life. <laughs> you know, successful communities pick and choose among development proposals. You know, and never doubt that a small group of people can indeed change a community. These are the people who get behind whatever your vision is to see that it actually gets into them. And I know it's not always easy getting things done in America. And no is a powerful word in this country, but I'm going to tell you a more powerful word, yes. Yes, we can make Cedar Rapids a better place to live in, to look at, to work in, to visit. A pessimist sees difficulty in every opportunity, but an optimist sees opportunity in every difficulty. You know, leadership is darn important, but, you know, it really doesn't matter if you, 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 don't, care, you don't care who gets the credit done, you get an awful lot done. I love this quote from Monty Python. He says, apart from sanitation, medicine, education, why public order, roads, irrigation, public health, and fresh water system, what have the Romans ever done for us? <laughs> and that's kind of what we think about our public officials sometimes. And no matter what people come up with, people will tell you, you can't do it, won't work, it costs too much, try it already. But, you know, if you're willing to go to work to see that your vision actually gets implemented, it will in fact get done. Ladies and gentlemen, vision counts, but implementation is priceless. Thank you so much for having me. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have or comments that people would like to make. Uh, talk about a lot more of this kind of stuff if you guys want to. Have you given this presentation to our city council? Not that I know of unless they're here tonight. Well, that's what I'm, I'm looking around and trying to see how many uh, council members are here. Um, unfortunately, there's a, a budget meeting tonight, so they're all there. But we're going to send the video, video out to everyone. I did, a, I did a shorter version of this last year as a TED Talk. If you just Google Ed McMahon TED Talk, you can get a 15-minute version of this. Yeah, we can just talk faster. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I talked a lot faster. <laughs> other, other questions? Yes, ma'am. We just uh, fought a shot, though, that our town council and the mayor had uh, sort of entertained. 
and we have a small town, 3,000 people, right. town square, city yeah. park in the middle, yeah. and uh, it was on an additional city park that was originally part of the historical part, and they right. wanted to put a shop up there. And Is that a grocery store? It's like a, it's like a little Walmart, okay. and um, which we didn't need, and yeah. once the people actually heard about it, Everybody was up in arms because we didn't want to lose our regular business, and we knew we would. So I, I'll tell you a funny story about grocery stores, urban grocery stores. So when I first moved to Washington Law School many years ago, we had two grocery stores in the city. They were both Safeways. We called one the Soviet Safeway. It didn't have any food. You had to wait in line to get what little they had. The other one was over in Georgetown. We called that the Social Safeway because of the hot dating scene that occurred there. Uh, but now we have 32 grocery stores in the city. And guess what? Every single one of them is sitting on the sidewalk. Who would have thought that that was possible? Okay? We have the highest gross of Whole Foods in the United States of America, P Street Northwest. There's no parking in front of it because it's in a walkable uh, neighborhood. We got the, 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 the Safeway in Georgetown. The parking's on the roof. And that's what's happening all over the place. People are just, all the things that people used to tell you they can't do, couldn't do, wouldn't do, they're doing all of them all over the country. And so when people say they have to develop in a park, don't believe it, you know, because they've done it different ways in other places. And if it's good enough for other cities, it's good enough for Cedar Rapids. You know, they, all the time these companies just make you feel like, you know, if you, do you think that if, a, uh, if one of these chain stores or franchises went into a lot of Santa Fe, New Mexico, or Santa Barbara, California, they would expect to do their standard off-the-shelf stuff? Of course not, because they know those communities have higher expectations. That's our problem. We don't have high enough expectations. Raise our expectations, you'll get better development as a result. Yes, sir. What do you think of uh, casinos as urban economic development? Have you ever seen it work well? Uh, it, the, the answer to that is I've never seen it work well, and I'll tell you why, because casinos don't, uh, people who go to casinos don't want to do anything else, and that's why they don't have any windows in casinos. They don't even know what, want you to know what time of day it is. And so, yes, casinos can produce tax revenue, and I'll give you a great example of that. Bethlehem, Pennsylvania does have a new casino, but they dedicated all of the revenue there to the restoration of the Bethlehem Steelworks, which is now going to become the Museum of, in of Industrial History for the United States. So they actually are using the money for a very specific purpose. The steel mill is at the, I mean, the casino's at the end of the old steel mill complex. Look, it's, it's very... You know, taint, you know, it's really kind of like, it looks like an old industrial building. They did a really nice job. Unlike the new casino in Maryland, which is probably the ugliest building on the planet, it's a, uh, we put our casino, it's in an eight story parking garage in a parking lot, and the casino's on the first floor of the parking garage, a concrete parking garage. That's our casino. We call that Maryland Live. I, I, I was in Wheeling, West Virginia uh, last year, and they thought the casino was the savior of Wheeling, West Virginia. I don't know if they've been to Wheeling uh, lately. Uh, but all of, you know, they, of course, they didn't put it anywhere near the downtown, but not that anybody would necessarily go to downtown anyway. Uh, they put all their money, and nothing, the other thing they decided to do was to put a, uh, uh, a Bass Pro Shop 10 miles outside of town. They've got probably the best Victorian architecture in the United States where they haven't done anything with. The city's just dying. So I'm not a big fan, you know. You know, the reason we, we all want casinos is because we don't want to pay any taxes for anything. We want the best of everything. We're not willing to pay for anything. So, yeah, let's get casinos. But I, I've seen very few examples where they've brought communities back to life. Yes, sir. I'm interested in this idea of, of, of fear of, of saying no to development because uh, the idea is that we want as much development as possible in some people's minds. So the, the thing I'm, I'm trying to rectify in my mind is... Yes. Raising expectations without appearing as though all you're offering is sticks, because implementation of those things quite often amounts to ordinance changes and some of these things, which viewed by the development community sometimes uh, looks like uh, your, your higher expectations amount to more money for me. And so is there a correlation between how hot the development market is and how high you can set your expectations? Yeah, well, that, that, you know, absolutely. I mean, for example, that Walmart I showed you in Washington, D.C., well, Washington is a hot market city, so all the big box stores, Target, Walmart, wanted to be in the city because it was the only place they didn't have any stores, right? All the stores were out there. So yes, that is a factor, but here's, here's something else you got to think about. So what we've done for years is we've made it like super easy to develop out there on, you know, green fields, and we've made it hard to develop 
in town, okay? And, you know, basically you need to kind of reverse that. So you want to make it easier to develop in places that you want development, and you want to make it harder to make it development in places that you don't want it. So, you know, we go around town today, and you've got so many vacant lots in this downtown, it's unbelievable. You, have, you wouldn't have to build another thing out there for the next 20 years. You could put every single thing, like in this downtown in the first ring around it. You've got plenty of room to do that, okay? But, you know, nobody has anybody done an inventory of all the vacant lots. Have you made it easy to work with them? On, you know, you need to use public-private partnerships to, you know, if there's toxic issues, clean that up. In other words, you've got you to make it, figure out how to work together to get the things done that you want done. And, you know, and just stop, you know, when somebody just, you know, here, I have a good friend, Tom Murphy. He's the former mayor of Pittsburgh. He was a mayor for three terms. He's the guy that basically flipped, turned Pittsburgh around. And Tom Murphy says that, you know, the difference between a good mayor and a bad mayor, in his estimation, is, you know, a lot of mayors are simply transaction driven. So like somebody comes in, some developer walks in their office and says, I got a deal for you. And then they just want to sell the city on what they want to do. What Tom Murphy says is you always need to ask that person, well, how does that project help us? How does it help us foster our vision for the future? That's kind of why you need a vision. You need to harness the transactions to the larger blueprint of where you're going. And so that the development that you do get is actually going to further, you know, it creates sort of the synergy. You know, what we've been having happen in so many American cities is we get sprawl without population growth. Basically, we, you know, we either lose population completely or we just take the same amount of people and just spread them around. And that's what, you know, we've got to pay more for, you know, road maintenance and road everything. It just costs more. You've got all this existing infrastructure down here. Right? So why not reuse it? Why not make it easier to reuse and redevelop the places that you already have instead of investing all your money? There's a, there's a uh, great guy, he runs a program called Strong Towns, Chuck Maroon. You should have him come time, sometime and talk about the economics of, you know, single-use big box development versus mixed-use downtown development. And, you know, They've been doing this all over the country now. So, for example, you know, how many jobs per acre will a Walmart create versus a mixed-use project downtown? I mean, one of the reasons the Walmart we see works is we're putting housing on top of all of them, right? And so, it's a it's a whole different thing when you start doing sort of mixed-use, which is what we always did. That was our model for development in America for hundreds of years. You know, we had a model in this country. It was called a town. And, you know, the towns always had an edge in a center. They were always walkable and pedestrian friendly. We always had a mix of uses and housing types. And, you know, they were always walkable and pedestrian friendly. Then we just forgot that model, threw it out the window in about 1960, came up with this new model, which were everything, we had drive everywhere for everything. Everything was ugly and chaotic. You put this high school over here, the shopping center over there, the housing development over here. Then you segregate all the housing by income. So you put the $400,000 houses in this development and the $200,000 houses over here. You put the townhouses somewhere, but it didn't come with a town anymore. And you know, when, when the new urbanists to build uh, seaside Florida, basically what they were saying was small towns in America are not just a charming anachronism. They're actually a model for how we could build in the future. And like, we're doing that again. And, and, it's, and it's working. And so, you know, it's amazing to me that the development paradigm is in America is changing for the better. It is harder to see some places than other places because it all starts sort of on the coast. It kind of moves in. It starts in the bigger cities. There is not a single new strip mall being built anywhere in the Washington metropolitan. Everything is in mixed use development. Everything. You know, like grocery stores with the parking on the roof or under the building or behind the building. It's not out in front with a big parking garage. Because nobody walks. Nobody will walk past a parking lot. So, you know, why would anybody walk, you know, on a highway strip? You can you put a sidewalk out there, but nobody will walk because it's just like scary and ugly. nobody will ride a bike. You know, so when you start thinking about those things, you just start to make everything sort of change over. Other thoughts? Yes, in the back. Um, local Cedar Rapids guy grew up here. Love my town, but one of my chief complaints about Cedar Rapids or stereotypes that I think is, is what? One of my chief complaints about Cedar Rapids, or one of the stereotypes I think is true, is that um, we like our chains. 
right. more than we like mom and pops. Right. And I think we're getting better about it. But what would you say, what, what's a way to change that? Well, and I have a couple things about that. I'm not, I'm not against change per se. I'm all, all I would say is that uh, you can get you can take a change store on your terms, in term, at least in terms of the architecture and design of the building. And what I've suggested to you is that all the chains actually have all kinds of plans, and they just want to do their off-the-shelf model and you know communities they think they can get away with that so walmart or so walgreens will come in and knock down in some building but they wouldn't do that in oak creek you know, oak park illinois they would you know let me just give you an example so uh <laughs> so uh chicago has this ordinance where all the train drugstores have to meet the street on two sides they got to come to the corner basically and that was a came out of the planning department when Richard Daly was the mayor there, Richard Daly Jr. Uh, and uh, what happened was Chicago, as you may know, has like 50 member city council and all the councilmen have like veto power over in their districts and so forth. So Walgreens had gone to the city council was get, and was fighting the city the planning department on these design standards for chain drugstores. Walgreens had announced that we're going to build like 50 new drugstores in Chicago. Okay. And they, they want to just put the, you know, like suburbanize the city, put a parking lot around the whole thing, right? And the planning department was trying to get them to build all the buildings out to the corner. And, and nothing was happening because they were fighting this with the city council. So finally, the planning director goes to the mayor, Richard Daly, and says, you know, uh, here's what we're trying to do. We want to get these strange drug stores to, you know, fit in with our neighborhoods better. And he tells them what's going on. So what does David do? He says, get me the president of Walgreens on the phone right now. Calls him up, gets him on the phone. He says, you want to do business in Chicago? You stop passing my plant apartment, you build all your drug, all your drug stores out to the corner. They've done, they've done it. That's called leadership. Okay? You know, but, you know, why, if they, if they do it in Chicago, why wouldn't they do it in Des Moines? Or why wouldn't they do it in Cedar Rapids? Of course they will. You know, it's just up to you to say, you know, and the other thing about, you know, let's talk, you know, the one thing about local mom and pops, you kind of forget this. If you spend money in a locally owned store, that money will recirculate through the city about three times more than it will through a chain store because the local guy, he has a local accountant, he has a local marketing group, he has a local advertising group, he has, you know, all the employees. You, you spend money like at Walmart, I understand the prices are low there, but most of that money is going to Bentonville, Arkansas. It's not being recirculated through. See the rat. So that's one of the reasons why this idea of shop local. And one of the one of the places that it's actually started to make a difference is in bookstores. So for a while, because of Amazon, all the bookstores in America were going out of business. But guess what? Small locally owned business bookstores are coming back, and it's because they actually have. have it's part of what what's called the experience economy. So young people, it, and there's all kinds of surveys on this, but young people will say that they that experiences are more important than stuff. Think about that. Experience is more important than stuff. So, like, all these small open bookstores have book clubs, book groups, author lectures. Uh, they have travel. You know, they have things where they put together groups that go on, like, outings, et cetera, et cetera. We have a bookstore in my neighborhood called Politics and Prose. They have an event every night. Okay, same thing with lodging. So, you know, for years, every new motel, hotel was out on the highway somewhere. Uh, you, know, no, you know, you couldn't stay in a downtown. It meant a lot of places. But here's what young people say about hotels. They say that authenticity and interesting is more important than predictable and comfortable. Why do you think we've seen the growth of Airbnb? Okay, so guess what? Marriott now, this year, 20% of all the new courtyards by America and the United States will be in restored historic buildings, not in new buildings. That's, a, that's, that's like a real change. And, because, and, and all of the change, whether it's Holiday Inn, Hilton, you know, they're all coming up with these brands that people don't even know are associated with, like a, a loft. All these, you know, I went to some hotel in Atlanta. It was so minimalist, it didn't even have any furniture. I was like, I said, sleeping on the floor. <laughs> 
but it was like all the hipsters wanted to uh, stay. I'm too old to be a hipster. I kind of wanted a bed. It was like I had to sit like, like this. But this is part of what's happened. And part of it is letting, you know, understanding the economics. You know, I had a uh, developer say to me a couple months ago, he said, you know, developers need to study demographics the way a stockbroker studies the market. Because success is about getting in front of the inevitable. And, you know, when you understand where the world is going, you know, let me give you one statistic. It just kind of blows you away. So, you know, 15 years ago, by age 20, 92% of all Americans had a driver's license. You know what the percentage is today? 70%. Okay? Don't even care if they get a driver's license. And in, and in cities, it's even less than that. So, you know, all of the... Rental car companies like Hertz, Avis, are now getting into the car sharing business. Zipcar, you know, they work. Because young people, it turns out, you know, it used to be getting a driver's license was a ticket to freedom. Now the ticket to freedom is they move to Denver, Colorado, and they, you know, get around living in the city. And they get by, if you, you know, by the way, if you could get by with one less car in a family, that's an average of $11,000 a year. That's a that's a hundred and thirty thousand dollars you can say if you ditch college by the time they got the college, just one less car. Which is why what's the fastest growing form of transportation in America? Bicycling. Who'd have thought? You know, and you know, people won't, the only reason people don't ride bikes more is because it's so unsafe. For those, you know, most places are just riding out in the street. But when they start putting in separate bike trails and protected bike lanes, it's incredible. People the, the biking is growing up going up by hundreds of percent in cities that actually are investing in bicycle infrastructure. I used to run a program called the American Greenways Program, and I would give out grants to build trails. And I would go into towns all over America, and somebody would always say to me, well, uh, nobody in our community will ever ride a bicycle. And I would say, OK, well, nobody will ever ride a bicycle. There's no place to ride the bicycle. But when people actually have safe places to ride, people like to do that, because it's good for your health. It's, you know, what, what's it cost to, you know, Eleven to thirteen thousand dollars a year to maintain a car for insurance, your gas, your upkeep, etc. What's the cost for a bike? About a couple hundred dollars a year. You know, so young people are starting to, you know, and the cities that make it easy for young people to do the kinds that they want to do are going to be the more successful cities. So I mean, that's why you need to think. This is all about competition. You are in competition with hundreds of other small cities. So you know, don't get left behind. I mean, you need to start thinking about where you're going. I, you know, that's my pitch. So you can do stuff with change. I, I mean, your change are here to stay. But you know, if you go, for example, in Europe, like every McDonald's and this has always been in historic buildings. I mean, it's like they just like that's just the way they require them to do it there. Other couple, couple more questions. Yes, up and back. Your primary presentation was focusing on revitalizing like commercial areas. Yep. It, um, what about residential areas? Well, yeah, I mean, I think we need to do both. How is it different, I guess? Yeah, what, I, what I'm suggesting, what I, I think my major suggestion about that is that we have, as I said, an oversupply of large lot single family housing and an undersupply of everything else, which is why the, the hottest, you know, market in America right now is for apartment buildings, multifamily housing, because after the recession, home ownership has dropped precipitously in America. And then in addition, a lot of young people don't think of home ownership as a good investment. They think it's something that ties them down. So they actually like this idea. And, and you know, so, you know, there's a lot of these, like, warehouses, things you could turn into other kinds of housing. And, what, you know, like, and here's another thing, like, people hate it, so like me. So most people, I'm, I'm not somebody, and I would say in, in all AARP and everybody else will tell you, they've done all kinds of studies. Most people don't want to live in, like, a home with just, like, other old people. They like the idea of aging in place, right? Or living in a community with people of all ages, okay? But it's actually hard to do in some places because if you're too old to drive or too sick to drive or too handicapped to drive or too young to drive, you're kind of out of luck in America, right? So designing neighborhoods where people can walk to a few things, like having a cone corner store, for example, uh, allows people to age in place. So senior housing is something. We're going we're to need a lot more of that because America is aging. 10,000 people a day turning 65. It's going to happen for the next 20 years. 
So the percentage of seniors is going up. What kind of, and where, did, where are they mostly going to want to live? They're not all moving to Florida, I can tell you that. Other thoughts? What recommendations do you have for somebody that wants to make a difference to Cedar Rapids, Iowa, from what you're saying? Well, you know, I, I think, you know, there's a couple of things. You know, there's a, a uh, first of all, there's an old saying that pictures worth a thousand words. But what's worth a, what's more what's worth a thousand pictures is a real project on the ground that people can kick the tires on. So I would say if you want to, if you have an idea of something you want to do, don't pick the hardest thing first. Pick the easiest thing first. And you know, because you have to create a sense of belief that if you do something, that it can make change a place for the better. And I talked this idea of like carrots versus sticks. Let me just give you an example of this. So. There's a small town in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia, Stanton, Virginia. It's always listed in sort of the top 10 small towns in America. And in 1978, there was a proposal to create a historic district in all of downtown. And not just a national register district, but a locally designated district that would you know, regulate demolitions and the character of new construction and all this kind of stuff. And it was like, hell no, over my dead body. You're not telling me what to do with my building. And the historic district did not pass. But there was a small group of people in the city They had set up something called the Historic Stanton Foundation. And they didn't give up. What they did was they offered free design assistance to anybody who would restore the facade of their downtown commercial building. They didn't pay for the renovation, but they had an architect who would volunteer to draw up what, if you took your aluminum siding down and restored the old building, here's what it would look like. And one person did it, and the building looked fantastic. And somebody came over and said, how'd you do that? Then two people did it. Then three people did it. Guess what? Now there are, the entire city is an historic district. There are residential districts all over the place. But it all began with an incentive. One project. And, you know, you know kind of it's you know, sort of like I, I mentioned, like bike trails. That's something I've been involved with for a long time. So I was working on this project in Tallahassee, Florida. It's called the Hogtown Creek Greenway. It was basically it was a bike trail along a creek. It went through town, including it went through the, one of the nicest neighborhoods in Tallahassee. And about half the people, and this was back in the 80s, were like, great, I really like this idea. The other half were, oh God, this, somebody's going to come steal my television set on their bicycle. If they have to. <laughs> and so it was very controversial. So what did we do? We organized a tour of all the leadership of Tallahassee to go to St. Petersburg, Florida, to visit this thing called the Pinellas Trail, which is the longest bike trail in Florida. It goes from St. Petersburg to Tarpon Springs, 57 miles, okay? And the story is, when it was, it was an abandoned railroad line, now turned into this hiker, uh, you know, jogging, hiking, biking uh, trail. And when it was first proposed, it went through in St. Petersburg through this neighborhood with a lot of retirees, and they was the same thing. Hell no, I don't want this behind my house. And, but it was approved, and then they demanded that the state of Florida put up a 10-foot high stockade fence behind all their houses, okay? But when we get there, which is 15 years later, there are no stockade fences left. And all the retirees are sitting in, in lawn chairs out there watching the cyclists go by. One guy's got a coat machine in his backyard with a sign that says, I make change. <laughs> and the story they tell us is that what happened was they opened the bike trail, they had all the fences behind their houses, and within two months, the first of the homeowners back, demanding that the state of Florida pay to put a gate in their fence because their grandchildren have shown up and they want to ride their bikes on that bike trail, but they can't get to it, okay? That's how things change, okay? One thing at a time. You know, this city has been tearing down one historic building at a time for years. Everything, that's, you know, it's kind of like the old story about the frog. If you, you know, throw a pot of boiling water, it jumps out. But if you just turn it up like one degree an hour, he's dead before he knows it because change is so gradual. But, you know, if you, you know, it's like, so let me give you an example of a city that's gone the other way. So Char Charlotte, North Carolina, 15 years ago, said that on major commercial arteries, every building had a build to line as opposed to a setback from line. So, all the parking lots were always in front of every building, like strip centers. But now everything from the Home Depot on is pulled up to the street and the parking is always in the middle of the block. Gas stations, you name it. 
So the, you know, the building comes out to the hot sidewalk and the gas pumps are in the middle of the block. And they just started that. Now you go there and it's like you couldn't believe the change. Communities, you know, if you start tomorrow and just, you know, do one thing different, 10 years, this would be a totally different place. But you got to decide what those things are that you want to do and start working on it. I mean, you got some incredible assets here. And, you know, part of it is really identifying the assets and growing those assets. I mean, one of the things that hit me is having this river. I mean, I was in, I, I was in, I've been in Des Moines like two or three times in the last year. And then this incredible bike trail system along the river in Des Moines that they're building to get access to the river. Here, it's just like, it looks to me, I don't know, you had a big flood, it looks like a big flood plain there. You know, but, but the rivers, are, it's not just a flood hazard, it's also an asset. You know, people like to be able to see water, access water, use water. You know, Fargo, North Dakota is a great example. They had a huge flood there. They've created an incredible park system now along the, uh, the river in, in Fargo with all kinds of trails, and they got new housing up against the parks there and so forth. I'll give you another example, Charleston, uh, Charlotte, North, I mean, uh, Charleston, South Carolina. The, the mayor there, Joe Riley, he was the longest serving mayor in America, 40 years, 10 four year terms. He just stepped down. Charleston's one of those cities that gets better every time you go there. He's the reason. And they had this, they have these two rivers around Charleston, the Ashley River and the Cooper River. And the Cooper River was the industrial waterfront. And it's like everywhere else, you know, it's like all the industry had gone. And they had all these abandoned warehouses and what have you. Nothing was going on. So these developers came in and they had a proposal to build these high-rise condos right on the river. And all the economic development people were thrilled about this, like, oh boy, great, this is great. We're going to get these condos, high-rise condos, like 25-story condos on the river. And the mayor said, no, we're not going to do that. And, and these people were like, what? And he goes, no, we're going to give the best of the city to everyone. We're going to build parks along the Cooper River. And they did that. And you know where the most valuable land in all of South Carolina is today? It's the land next to the parks. But now everybody can get to the river, see the river, use the river. And the value accretion goes way back into the neighborhoods. It's not just the people who live right on the river. Because there's a, you know, there's a promenade along the entire river. So that's how you think, that's how you create value for more people. So it's thinking about those kind of kind of things. Thank you. All right, one more question. Yes, sir. So here in Cedar Rapids, for historic preservation, uh, we have a few National Register properties, and we have. So I see Bruce Moore. That's a pretty cool house. Yeah, yeah. We have uh, um, a historic preservation uh, ordinance that defines uh, districts. You know, yeah. uh, historic preservation. Districts that have qualified to be on the National Register as a, as a, as a neighborhood. Right. Okay. So we have a few of those, and there are some tax credits available if you do work on your house in, in those districts. Um, but that's that's about 20 years old now. You know, the, our historic preservation or, uh, ordinance. Right. Um, what we're we're kind of I think in need of some fresh ideas as far as especially for properties that aren't in those districts right. and don't qualify individually. What, yeah. what have you seen cities do? Well, a number of cities are creating what's called conservation districts. And, you know, uh, historic districts, depending on where you are and how you administer your ordinance, can be, in some people's estimation, a little nitpicky about small things like windows and things like that, things on the back of houses and so forth. So conservation districts, a number of communities have set these up, which is just basically like, okay, it's essentially like code enforcement on large scale things. So demolitions, like new additions, like you know, tearing off the entire front porch of a street with all the houses that have front porches, like the relationship of the building to the street. But they don't mess around with anything like paint colors or window treatments or anything like that. So that sounds more like what we have here. So and that allows more people to become, you know, and I'll tell you what, you know, I, I'm one of the, I, I was the chairman, of, I live in a small city called just uh, Tacoma Park, Maryland, we have about 21,000 people, it's the oldest suburb of Washington, and it was the, the first, it was kind of this funky little, thing. all the houses date from 1883 to 1941, basically, it was a street, had a streetcar line, went out there, so all the houses are Victorian to bungalow, right, 
But then when the metro came out there, it was one of the first five metro stations. Now we have like 150 metro stations, but we had five when they first opened, and one of those was Tacoma Park. And like overnight, like all the land in the city all of a sudden like doubled in value because you could now have a train that could go into the city. So that's when we set up the historic district because people wanted to come in and put like, you know, split level houses in the middle of all these Victorian houses. I, and I was the first chairman of the historic district. And just to give you an example, so I had this developer come in and all the houses, so it had, and he wanted to put this house with a great big garage sticking out in front of the house, like kind of like a snack. And the historic preservation said, no, you can't do that. You've got to detach the garage, put it behind the house. And this guy, like, went off on us like you would believe, like, no one's going to buy a house without an attached garage. That's what he said. And he was going to sue us if we didn't let him do what he wanted to do. So I said to him, well, there's 2,000 houses in our historic district, and not a single one has a garage, a attached garage, because there was no such thing until about 1960 in America. And I said, who's buying the rest of those houses? And it was like, oh, you know, okay. So he ended up building a beautiful Neo-Victorian with a detached garage. It sold in two days. It was kind of like behavior modification. It was like, <laughs> like, oh. But I tell you what, you know, so uh, our philosophy when we got our first store district was we didn't want, we wanted to, to protect the large scale things like that, okay? And on the other hand, there's another town, the next two towns over, Chevy Chase, Maryland, okay? They had a very different idea. They have a, about half, so about half of Tacoma Park was in the historic district, about half wasn't. Same thing happened in Chevy Chase, about half did here. I was the historic district chairman in Tacoma Park, and my philosophy was you only go to the mat on the really big things. Demolitions, new construction, you know, relationship with building street. You don't go to the mat on little things because that just pisses people off, pardon my French, and then you undermine support for preservation. Chevy Chase did that, okay? And they did not ever expand their storage district. Now Chevy Chase has the worst teardown problem in the Washington area. They're going in and buying up all these spec developers, buying up all the bungalows, tearing them down, putting giant McMansions, okay? But because we had so much support for preservation in Tacoma Park, we have now doubled the size of our district. And we have never had a single teardown because you can't do a teardown. You know, we have lots of new, we have lots of new construction on infill lots, all beautiful. We have lots of additions on small houses that are actually now a little bigger. But we had, because we had, we thought about how you created more support for preservation. And it wasn't about, you know, nickel and dime and people death on little things. It was about focusing on the, the bigger character issues. That's kind of the way I would think about how you want to, you know, I, I, there's some great little cities that I would go to and just like start taking a look at some of the things they're doing, like Lincoln, Nebraska. That's a great example of a small city that's really turned around, or uh, Burlington, Vermont, or Asheville, North Carolina. These are some of my favorite small cities. We have three organizations here in the city that are dedicated to historical preservation. Three different organizations. Well, they sort of work together. We have the Cedar Rapids one, yeah, yeah, yeah. we have the county one, yeah. and then the newest one is the Safe CR Heritage one. What's that? It's a... Uh, Oh, CR, Secretary of State, okay, CR, yeah, yeah, gotcha, okay. okay. And the groups will work together. Okay. And they'll work separately. And we're always looking for people to jump in and help out. Uh, Save CR, Heritage just moved a house over here on Fifth Avenue. Yeah, right. And an old house that would have been torn down, right. and now we're fixing it up to sell in the neighborhood. Right. Well, that's a great idea. I love revolving funds. You know, the, the uh, probably the most successful, one of the most, two, the two most successful statewide preservation organizations are Preservation Indiana and Preservation North Carolina. And they both have these very successful revolving funds where they would go in, acquire properties that were basically going to be torn down. They'd place restrictions on them and then resell them to somebody who was a buyer who wanted to restore that house. They had a lot of success with it. Let me mention one other thing that I think is worth thinking about. You know, Cedar Rapids has a very interesting history and a very interesting story. But I want to suggest to you that you want to think about ways to make the story of the city manifest in the landscape. Okay? And think about ways to use public art to do that. Okay? So let me give you just an example. So if anybody ever been to downtown Orlando, Florida, they have a square in downtown Orlando. And you think of Orlando sort of new Florida because of Disney World and all this stuff all around. 
But they actually had an old downtown, right? And they had this park there that's fantastic, right across the street from their library and the courthouse. And you know those old uh, postcards that look like, you know, you fold them in and out, and it'd be like 10 postcards, and they'd be like this? Well, they have a postcard like that. It's 25 feet tall. And each one of these things is 12 feet wide by like, you know, five feet high. And they all show you pictures of old Orlando, okay? And here's what old Orlando used to look like. Or, you know, we did a thing, we did, in our final town, we did an inventory of all the vacant, uh, boarded up buildings, and, I mean, excuse me, boarded up, boarded up, boarded up windows in downtown. And then we hired IRS to do trunk wall and murals in all the windows that were boarded up of people looking out the windows who were all people who were real people important in the history of our town. So the founder of the town, B.F. Gilbert, he's looking out one window, and Goldie Hahn, who grew up in Gilbert, is looking out another window, and Lee Jordan is a major league baseball player, he's looking out another window. Then we had these two kids from the Tacoma Park Elementary School, one's from Vietnam, one's from Guatemala. They were looking out another window. Then we got kids, we went to, there was a window across the street from this playground. We went to the, to the Tacoma Park Elementary School, let the first and second graders tell us what they wanted to put in this window. It's like the window is like maybe that big, and they put the face of a giant in there. So the giant, all you can see is his eyes and the top of his nose and his mouth. The kids just thought this was the coolest thing they'd ever seen. So part of it is just start thinking about what we have another thing. We have a huge mural that's like looks like a family album. Imagine if you took a like a photo album, you opened it up, and there's like pictures like in there. And we have, it's a painted mural on the side of a building that was a vacant wall. And each one of those pictures is important to the history of our town. So we have a picture of Wiley's Ice Cream Parlor that was the inspiration for the TV show Happy Days. So we have a little thing that tells you what that is. So, I mean, think about ways that you can make the story of Cedar Rapids because when, when you interpret, you know, people don't preserve what they don't understand. They don't know the story. And people will, you know, I'll come here and people will drive around and tell me the story. But somebody who's never been here, if it could just sort of, the story comes alive to them just on the streetscape. So there's a lot, and there's a lot of small things you can do. So get the arts community involved with the preservation community and start doing some fun things like that. Yeah? I, uh, let's have this be our last okay. question. We're a bit over time. So. Yeah. I had lived in Charlotte um, for a while, and I was on the Main Street community in a little town called Lincolnton, and I'm really interested in all this stuff. But one of the neat things in Nashville, North Carolina, I've always thought about could be for here, is they have that walking history with the art. And, with, and with the pigs and the, and yes, the music people. And, yeah. Right, and that would be a great idea for Cedar Rapids because our history isn't necessarily, you can't see it all, <coughs> but you could do a, an art presentation of Quaker Oaks and Sinclair and Grant Wood, and it could be a walking, walking thing tour, yeah. where you're reading your history on something where you look at the Quaker Oaks building yeah. here, and it's like not something great to look at, but it could be a part of the fabric of the history yeah. of the yeah. city. Yeah. And then you walk through, and I think that might be a great idea. Well, there, you know, there's stuff like, you know, I, I was uh, told the story earlier, that's the last thing I said. So uh, I was on a plane, I was flying to Memphis, and, and uh, it was a, like half the people on the plane were speaking French. And I'm like, well, that's kind of interesting. What are all these French people doing going to Memphis? So we're getting our luggage. And I go up to this French guy, and basically I say, well, what are you guys doing here? And he goes, oh, we come to drive the Blues Highway. Blues Highway, Memphis to New Orleans, okay? Now there is nobody in France that's going to decide I'm going to go on vacation to Clarksdale, Mississippi. But they will go to Clarksdale, Mississippi as part of the Blues Highway. So linking sites together is incredibly important. So like a walking trail that tells you the history of Cedar Rapids, I love that idea. And there are many themes you could do that. Uh, you know, so there's, you know, there's a lot of cool things you could do that would, that would help make the story of the town come alive, and then people get more interested in the history of the, of the city, which gets them more supportive of historic preservation. Anyway, I hope I'll give you some food for thought. Thank you so much. For